Yay. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. I got a text message from Mary Shore. She's in Arizona. She's freezing. We're grateful as we gather this day for God's faithfulness to us. Uh, thank you to all of you for your care and concern over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks with illness. So, and thank you, uh, Pastor Denver, for preaching last Sunday as well and pitching in. Very grateful. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Uh, as we gather following services, our fellowship time will be up here in the atrium because then our uh, Celebrating Dreams Gospel Jamboree will be here at 11 o'clock then in the sanctuary. So welcome to have some snacks and then stay as we celebrate uh, the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. in our 21st um, Celebrating Dreams Gospel Jamboree and honor Janice Forrest who is receiving the Legacy Award today. So we're very grateful to gather uh, for that today. You'll see that your newsletter uh, never got to you so if you need a printed copy there in the back, uh, in the lobby, in alphabetical order, and you're welcome to pick one up, as well as the latest devotional for the quarter. I don't know if you knew this, but Thursday was uh, Intern Rachel's birthday. So everybody, happy birthday, yay. Uh, if you had a birthday in the month of January, you wanna just uh, wave your hand. Anyone else have a birthday in the month of, of January? Torg, everybody. Happy birthday, Tori. Anyone celebrate an anniversary in the month of January? Oh, Torg and Maggie. Happy anniversary. Nice. What a wonderful birthday gift uh, as you celebrate your anniversary as well. Next week is our annual report review, and then in two weeks, our congregational meeting right after the service uh, on the 28th. So please note that for your calendar. Uh, today, as we gather at the font, we uh, ask God's strength and mercy for the family of, of Verna J, who passed away um, last Friday. Uh, her service will be on February 20th. Uh, so please keep uh, Verna's family in your prayers as we plan to gather. And then also, um, are your prayers for the family of Jean Westman. Uh, Jean passed away, um, I think it was Friday. Um, he had been um, failing and in hospice care. And he actually went uh, peacefully, and uh, Kathy and Jeff extend um, our, their thoughts as they prepare for a service there, and then in the spring, something up here. So we give God thanks for God's faithfulness to Jean's and to Jean's family, uh, and God's grace and mercy for a generation of service that Jean demonstrated. And so I just thank God for um, his life and the chance. Uh, he's been down in Carolinas for a little over two and a half years with Kathy and Jeff, so a uh, peaceful time with them, we pray. Let us stand, if you're able, as we gather at the font and remember God's faithfulness to us and God's calling out to us again. take a moment and hear and remember that God continues to call out to us and our response is speak Lord your servants are listening blessed be the holy trinity one God creator of darkness and light Word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and our refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant. Renew your creation. Restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. 
By the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us sing our Kyrie and hymn of praise in unison. Oh, oh, oh. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly, day by day, praising you with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Be seated. The first lesson today is from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun, begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord again called. Samuel, Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expatiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall on the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. We'll read Psalm 139 responsively. Lord, you have searched me out. O oh, Lord, you have known me. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. You, 
You encompass me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depth of the earth. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died so that you may not grieve as others do and have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. The Gospel according to John, the first chapter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Can anything good come from Nazareth? When I was doing my preparation for today's sermon, I was a little taken aback by the question that Nathaniel asked of Philip. I wondered, what does that mean? What does it mean, could anything good come from Nazareth? I did some digging and I learned that 
Cana is about four and a half miles away from Nazareth. Some biblical scholars believe that maybe there was a rivalry between the two villages. There's no for sure, no way to know for no way to know for sure if that is true or not, but that is that is a common belief. So when Nathaniel asked Philip, can anything good come from Nazareth? I, I, I hear a, a thread of doubt in his faith that Jesus is the true Messiah, the true King of Peace, the true Son of God. Nathaniel is only mentioned twice in the Bible. He's mentioned twice in the book of John, but he's also believed to be the same as Bartholomew. Now, we know that Bartholomew was a disciple of Jesus, so eventually we know that Nathaniel does come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and decides to follow him and become a disciple. But what happens before that? Our gospel message paints a really beautiful picture. Jesus is traveling through Galilee, and he comes across Philip. He says to Philip, come and, and be with me, be my disciple. Philip is so excited that he came across Jesus that he decided to go to his friend Nathaniel and invite him to come as well. He finds Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree and says, Nathaniel, we found him. They found him. They found Jesus, the Son of God, who Moses wrote about, who the prophets wrote about. Come and see. Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathaniel is questioning, he is doubting, but he decides to get up from the fig tree and go with Philip. When he arrives at Jesus and Jesus sees Nathaniel coming, Jesus says, Nathaniel, there you are. There you are, an Israelite with no deceit. You are here. Nathaniel says, How do you know me? I've never met you before. How do you know that I am Nathaniel? Jesus says to him, Nathaniel, I saw you sitting under the fig tree before Philip came to find you. I can't help but imagine what it would feel like to be Nathaniel. I, I picture myself sitting under a tree on a hot summer day and my friend coming to me and saying, We found Jesus. Come with me. Come see him. Come meet him. I can't help but wonder whether or not I, too, would doubt like Nathaniel. Jesus, the Son of God, the true Messiah, you're telling me that you found him, and he came from Nazareth. So let's unpack that Nazareth doubt a bit. Nazareth is about four and a half miles from Cana, where Philip, or where um, Nathaniel was born. Nazareth is a small village, a rural village, it's not located on a common road. It's not something, a village that you would pass while traveling. If you go to Nazareth, you are going with intention. It's not something you just stumble upon. There is a belief at this time that the people of Nazareth, so some biblical scholars believe, that people from Nazareth were what we would consider a hillbilly or uneducated or someone kind of out in the wilderness that doesn't really know what they're talking about. So when Philip says that they found the Messiah, they found the Son of God and he comes from Nazareth, maybe it's understandable why Nathan doubts. Nazareth, the town that nobody really believes that anything good can come of, the town that is of people who are a small village, a rural town, that nobody goes to, nobody travels to, nobody's intentionally looking for Nazareth unless they are intentionally looking for Nazareth. So there's a peak of interest. There's, there's a thread of doubt, but Nathaniel is also interested in whether or not Philip is being honest, if they really did find the Son of God. So Nathaniel decides to go. They go and they wander and they travel and they find Jesus and Jesus knows Nathaniel as soon as he sees him. Nathaniel is taken by surprise. He can't believe that this man from Nazareth, this, this hillbilly, this rural man, this, this nobody, knows him. Knows him and saw him before Philip was even there. I can't imagine what that must have felt like for Nathaniel, this earth-rocking revelation that 
This really is the Messiah. This really is the Son of God. I imagine that in that brief conversation that he was deconstructing all of these preconceived notions he had about Nazareth. That maybe Nazareth isn't just a place full of rural hillbillies that are uneducated and don't have a purpose in society. Maybe he was deconstructing this idea that the, the, the Messiah, the Son of God, would come from any place other than a, a city of power, of authority, like Jerusalem, where the temple of God was. I imagine that he was going through these mental obstacles and roller coasters of what he thought to be true versus what really was true. Nathaniel had enough faith to believe when Jesus saw him and called him by name. He had enough faith to trust that Jesus was the Messiah, that it was true, that he was the one that the prophets wrote about, that he was the one that Moses wrote about in the law. So Nathaniel, too, became a disciple. Jesus, being from Nazareth, didn't make a lot of sense. Nazareth, being a small rural village, wouldn't be the first place on someone's mind when they thought about where the Messiah would show up. It would be like saying, Jesus was from here in Rockford versus maybe New York City or San Francisco or Chicago. Rockford is a little out of the ordinary, not what you would want, not what you would believe. There's this belief that the Messiah, who is the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, the King of all creation, would inherently become, be, be from a city of great power and authority. It would make sense to me if I were to put myself in the shoes of the Jews at the time. I would imagine that I, would, I too would think that we should look to the city of Jerusalem for where the Messiah would be. I would be taken by surprise if my friend Philip came to me and said, we found Jesus and he is in Nazareth. That would surprise me. Nathaniel is really interesting because even though he doubts, he still has faith. He wants to believe. He doubts and questions the validity and the truth of whether Jesus is the true Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. But he is curious. He's curious enough and his faith is strong enough that he's willing to test his doubts. He's willing to test the waters and see what's true. Maybe he's wrong. Maybe his mind could be changed. Maybe what he was told for so long isn't the actual truth and there is new truth and there's new things to be learned. Our gospel message today is very short, but I find it to be very profound. Nathaniel has a complete change of character from the beginning of our gospel to the end of our gospel. He goes from being a person sitting under a fig tree, doubting and, and, and having these preconceived notions about Nazareth and anyone that comes from Nazareth, to being a devout disciple of Jesus to going out and inviting other people to come and see and meet Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. It's pretty beautiful if you think about it. Today is also the second Sunday after Epiphany. We remember today and last week the journey that the Magi took following the star to find the King, the Son of God, the Messiah. When I was writing my sermon and preparing for today, I couldn't help but think, did the Magi also doubt? We don't read that anywhere. We don't see that there was conversations of doubt and wonder and confusion and whether or not they were actually on a journey to the real king or if they were being scammed. We don't, we don't know, but I imagine that possibly they had these same questions, these same fears and these same doubts. But they had enough faith, they trusted enough to keep going. Like Nathaniel, they were 
They were following this idea, this invitation to come and see the child of God, the Prince of Peace, the Messiah. They put their fears and their doubts to the side. They held on to them, but they held them to the side as they continued on their journey. Today we also celebrate the legacy and honor of the life and work of Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a profound civil rights activist in our society. I can't help but think whether or not Martin Luther King Jr. found himself doubting and questioning his call that was placed upon him by God to lead society to a new idea of freedom and equity and love, to this new idea of a beloved community. I can't help but wonder if there were times where Martin Luther King Jr. felt like all of the work he was doing was not going anywhere, was not worth it. He wasn't seeing the fruits of his labor, maybe, and I would imagine, as, as well as he thought he would or he wanted to. I would imagine that there was doubt there. I would imagine that there was fear. But like the wise men and like Nathaniel, Martin Luther King Jr. kept going. He was rooted in his call. He was rooted in his belief that God placed a call upon him and he had enough faith to be strong and keep going. Even when the world was telling him to stop, even when the society was shutting down the rallies and marches and protests and turning fire hoses on he and his people, even when they were faced with extreme violence at the, and the response of their own nonviolence, Martin Luther King Jr. kept going. He remained faithful. He remained committed to his call. These three characters, Nathaniel, the wise men, and Martin Luther King Jr., to me, all have something in common. They all were called by God to do something specific. They all had strong enough faith to hold on to their call, even in the midst of doubt, even in the midst of fear. They held that fear, they carried that fear with them until they saw Jesus. Until they saw that what they were being told and what faith that they had were holding on to, they saw that it was true. They held on to that fear. When they met Jesus, when Nathaniel met Jesus of Nazareth, he released all of those preconceived notions. He released all of these doubts and fears that he had about whether or not Jesus of Nazareth was truly the Son of God, was truly the Messiah that Moses and the prophets wrote about. He let it go. The wise men, when they arrived and met Jesus, the Son of God, I would imagine that if they had doubts, they also let them go. That when they reached their destination, that when they found out that what they had been traveling to, what they had been following was real, all of those doubts and fears dissipated. Martin Luther King Jr., I imagine, was a bit different. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't live long enough to see the fruits of his labor full effect. I don't know if we still can say we see the fruits of his labor in full effect. But Martin Luther King Jr. held on to his faith and trusted that even if he didn't see his, the fruits of his labor come to fruition, that they would come that things would be different. He believed this because he believed in Jesus, because he believed in God, because he had a call placed upon him by God to shepherd the people into a new consciousness, a new idea of what it means to be an intentional, beloved community. I sometimes have doubts and fears in my faith. I felt a call to ministry when I was just 12 years old. I'm 28 years old now, so it's been a long journey, and there have been so many times in my journey that I have questioned whether or not this is truly 
what I'm called to do. I've questioned and doubted whether or not I had a strong enough faith to keep going in the face of adversity. I keep going because I have seen Jesus. Like Nathaniel, my doubt is released and let go and relinquished when I face Jesus in everyday life, when I can see God and tangible things in front of me, when I'm a part of intentional, beloved communities like the community of Zion, when we're with people who are so devoted to our faith and our relationships, my fears and my doubts about the future of ministry and the future of the church begin to dissipate. There's so much to learn from Nathaniel. There's so much to learn from someone who is brave enough to say, can anything good come from Nazareth? There's so much to learn from someone who's brave enough to name his doubt to name his fear and to name his questioning out loud and yet still get up and still go and still find Jesus on his journey. There's so much to be learned. There's so much to be learned from the Magi who traveled from far and followed a star in the sky at night to the Messiah. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what to expect when they got to their destination. They didn't even know if they would know when they got to their destination. And yet they kept going. They decided to hold their fears, but keep walking to go and see Christ, to go and see God. Martin Luther King Jr. was faced with opposition and doubt and violence and being told flat out, no, what you're fighting for is never going to work. What you're fighting for is not worth it. What you're fighting for is not what God is calling us to. Martin Luther King Jr. was brave enough to say, No. Maybe I'm wrong, but my God says no. My God has placed a call upon my heart, and so I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go and see where I can find Jesus. It's really beautiful when you stop and think about it. The other thing I find so beautiful about Nathaniel is not only was he brave enough to state out loud his doubts and his fears, he was also brave enough to be wrong. He was brave enough to have his mind changed. He was brave enough to say, this is what I believe. This is the stereotypes that I have. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I was taught wrong. Maybe the world that I grew up in isn't the full truth, isn't the whole truth. Maybe there's still more for me to learn. That is really beautiful to me. That's a really difficult decision to make. When we believe so wholeheartedly that something, an idea we have is true, it's hard to imagine what it would be like to be proven wrong. I come from Janesville, Wisconsin, not far from Rockford, about a 45-minute drive north. Rockford has a stigma. There's this stereotype about what life in Rockford is like, and I am guilty of holding on to that stereotype. I am guilty of believing in the things that I was taught my whole life about living in Rockford. When I was placed here at Zion and things were moving forward with my internship, my fear and my doubt about living in Rockford resurfaced. Rockford has the stigma of being a violent and desolate place, a place where there's per capita, an overwhelming amount of violence and poverty and just all around not good. I was afraid. I was fearful. I was nervous about what I would encounter, about what my life as an intern at this church would be like. I came, I saw Jesus, and I was wrong. Rockford is more than just violence 
and poverty. Rockford is more than just a community that has been forgotten and pushed to the side like many people seem to believe. God is here. Jesus is present in this space, in every space, in every person's life. Like Nathaniel, I was invited to come and see. And what I saw was so much profound beauty, was so much intentional love and commitment to the betterment of this community and the betterment of the lives of every single person. There are no exceptions. There is no fine print. When I think about the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., I think about his idea of this beloved community. I can't help but imagine what Martin Luther King Jr. would feel if he were present in this space, in this church with us. I can't help but imagine what Martin Luther King Jr. would feel on Saturdays at Ruthie's Kitchen when we open our doors and we serve food and clothing to anyone. I can't help but imagine what Martin Luther King Jr. would feel about Zion Development, would feel about Patriot's Gateway Center, would feel about the Buddy House or Katie's Cup or these deeply connected ecumenical relationships with other churches in the area. I can't help but wonder if Martin Luther King Jr. was here, if this would be where he saw Jesus. If this would be a setting where he could release his doubts and relinquish his fears and be present in the holy and beloved community that we are all so devoted to. We don't know what our future looks like. Nathaniel didn't know what the end of his journey meeting Jesus would be. Nathaniel didn't know that he would meet Jesus and become a disciple and invite other people to come and see. But he kept going. The wise men didn't know that they were going to find Jesus at the end of following the North Star, but they kept going. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't know if everything he was working for was going to be worth it, was going to be heard, was going to be felt, and was going to be integrated in every part of society in the United States, but he kept going. He kept fighting. He kept showing up. He showed up after the dogs were released. He showed up after the fire hydrants were opened. He showed up after rally was shut down. He showed up after he was arrested. He showed up in Birmingham. He showed up in Montgomery. He showed up. He kept showing up. We are invited by today's gospel to come and see. Jesus is calling out to us. We are all placed with a call upon our hearts to go and see, to find Jesus. And when we see Jesus, when we find Jesus along the way, we are then called to invite more people to come and see. We can be like Nathaniel and have doubts and fears. And we can also be like Philip who says, I hear you. Come with me. Come with me anyway and come see with me anyway. I have a book of a collection of um, the most famous speeches and writings and books of Martin Luther King Jr. I got this when I was studying college with my peace and justice major. I read this book through and through. I don't remember everything. But there's some things about some of the speeches that really stand out to me. And there's one speech in particular that stands out to me today more than anything. This is the last speech that Martin Luther King Jr. had before he was assassinated. It's a famous speech. I'm sure you all know what it is. It's a speech where he talks about, I have seen the promised land. I'm not going to read the whole speech, but there is a part in the end that is so profound 
and so tied to today's gospel that I can't help but share. Martin Luther King Jr. is speaking to a crowd. He doesn't know that his, the end of his life is coming. The sermon that he preached feels a little apocalyptic knowing what happens next. He delivered this speech at the Mason Temple in Memphis, Tennessee on April 3rd in 1968. The end of his sermon, he says this. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead of us, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned with that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop, and I've looked over, and I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not a fearing man. Mine eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. Jesus was with Martin Luther in that sermon. He was with Martin Luther in Memphis, Tennessee. Martin Luther let his fears go because he saw Jesus. He knew God was present, and he knew that he was in the the company of the divine, in the company of the holy. Nathaniel, when he saw Jesus, knew that he was in the company of the divine, in the company of the holy. The Magi knew that they were in the company of the divine, in the company of the holy. Come and see. You are all invited. We are all invited to come and see. To name our fears. To name our concerns. And to find Jesus along the way. And when we find Jesus, we are invited to release our doubts to release our fears, to know that we are exactly where God has called us to be and we are doing exactly as God has called us to do. My siblings in Christ, come and see. Know your fears, know your doubts, and know that it's okay. But trust in your faith And trust that even when you doubt, and even when you fear, God is with you. And you will see Jesus. And when you see Jesus, you will know that he is the Son of God. That he is the true Messiah. That he is the one whom Moses wrote about and the prophets wrote about. Come and see. Amen.
Please stand if you're able as we gather now and confess our faith in the one who has created us and called us through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks and praise for this day, for your church wherever it gathers this weekend to proclaim your goodness, to offer shelter, to feed those in need. Call your church again, O Lord, to this proclamation that you reign forever and ever. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, in this time of cold weather, we ask you to protect those who need shelter. Be with those who do not have heat and continue to call us to create places and spaces so people can avoid the elements. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your call to prophets who speak words that no one wants to hear, for the call and the burden, knowing that your voice speaks in the silence. Continue to send your spirit to call, to raise up leaders in this time that your word may be proclaimed, that visions of a beautiful community may be seen. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we give you thanks for those who serve and care for those in need, body, mind, and spirit. We pray especially for those who are dear to us who need your healing. For Eloise Anderson, Colette Bugart, Yolanda Churchill, Norma Dougherty, Jim Duhigg, Shirley Simmons, Deanna Hartenberg, Fonda Nielsen, Debbie Raymond, Linda Reinhart, Wayne Spitzer, and Linda Callahan. Grant them your healing and strength. I pray also for Malika Miller as she continues to heal. Lord, in your mercy. You grant comfort, O oh Lord, to those who grieve with the promise and hope of eternal life. Be with those families who experience loss at this time, especially for the families of Verna Jay, Bonnie Sundberg, and Jean Westman. Lord, in your mercy. Into your Lord we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord is with you all. Let us share a sign of that peace with one another. And those of you at home, God's peace as well. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. This time we'll prepare for Holy Communion. For those of you who have your individual communions, please take the bread. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken for you. Amen. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me, the blood of Christ shed for you.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth, send us forth as witnesses to your Son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world, through Christ our risen Lord. Amen. Let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. May the God of all creation in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign Savior and Spirit, be with you today and always. Please stand as we sing our sending song, How Marvelous God's Greatness. peace, God is at work with you. And again, our uh, fellowship time is right here in the atrium, and then at 11 o'clock we will promptly begin our Celebrating Dreams Gospel Jamboree. Amen. <laughs>